Yo, yo, what up, everybody? 8, 11 p.m. down here in Central Florida. Got a very cloudy, waxing gibbous moon tonight. But I wasn't going to miss it. Appreciate y'all joining. What's going on, Bryce? What's up, Kronos? What's up, Ellie? And whoever else is coming through. <laughs> We all start somewhere, kind of. <laughs> Six and eight are really good starter kits. I mean, I jumped to the 11 after two years, three years, but um, I'm still learning how to use the 11 properly. I can't even move it around. So there's that kind of sweet spot. I feel like an eight should be a nice kind of birthday present or Christmas present. <laughs> Set your sights on it. Saving a thousand bucks is pretty, it's not easy, but it's a good goal. Um, and if you have like the six inch, uh, I don't know, it depends. Like maybe you can put the eight, but you might want to get like the whole mount set up together. Or you could get the six inch Celestron with the fork arm mount and then use that same mount for like an eight inch tube, like in the future. Yo, what's going on, Andy Cowley? It's been cloudy all day, and I think it's going to be a little bit clearer in a bit. We'll see. It's going to be at least an hour of just hanging out, some jams, some cloudy moonage. I was reading up some articles today on moon news. I always like, before I start the stream, I'll type in moon news into Jujul, and then uh, it spits out all this random stuff. And the articles are always so you know, just very indecisive and vague. And then I looked up some of our um, our active missions, NASA active missions, and it's pretty, pretty interesting, actually. There are a lot of things going on. I was going to talk about a few of them. Um, but yeah, but further, I, I found a link that I do want to share with you all really quick, and it's about the science of bubbles. I've been talking about bubbles forming hexagons, but bubbles really, bubble science and fluid dynamics are really a very amazing field. And there, there is there's interesting science going on in that field, and people really focus on the right sort of thing, but there are also connections from bubbles to the electric universe concept that it aren't really being explored. But I think this video while the information is a little bit pedestrian, the, the actual visuals are pretty incredible. And like, I very rarely share videos from large um, super science channels, but this one only has like 287,000 subscribers called Spark, and the Science of Bubbles documentary is pretty great, actually. So it shows a lot of really magnetic fields, um, it shows how spheres form in air in order to create the minimum surface area. It talks about surface tension and viscosity and, and contaminating the water. And that's why wa water bubbles form very quickly, but then they dissipate. And contaminating water with, salt, uh, with uh, soap, for example, actually reduces surface tension and allows the bubble to keep form longer. And so things like, things like that, and on top of studying, you know, fractal vortices and uh, shifts along the surface of this tiny, very, very thin film. Really fascinating stuff. Yo, peace, respect, truth, smack, and activist on the corner. And what's up, Lumberjack? How's it going? What's up, Light Moon? I'm like halfway through dinner. I have stuff to cook, but I want to make sure I caught a quick glimpse of the moon. Day eight tonight. I've gotten it since 4% and moving through here till full. I want to get all of them. All right, let's play some jams here. I'm gonna have a quick smoke and look outside. Just want to make sure it doesn't rain on us, on me. 
No rain on me. I'm gonna play this back. And then, of course, if you're new or just listening to the show, please take a look at the description of this video and playlists where I've compiled a lot of the old shows and best of, as well as great links to Electric Universe channels, like my man Kronos in the chat, and David from Electric Universe Eyes, and Neil and Rick from, and Mike Duffy from uh, The Electric View. Sorry, <laughs> brain shortage. Uh, yeah. And I'll actually link to that Electric View show. I know I'm being a little bit narcissistic here, but I thought it was a very good energy synergy. It was very good synergy on this show. So let me link that. I finally got an opportunity to really talk about lunar features with a bunch of smart people. So I feel very lucky. Werewolf moon, exactly. Let's go. a little bit about these missions I checked up a couple of things like I looked up the annual budget of NASA over time <clears throat> and tried to kind of calculate what they would need in terms of you know money for salaries money for missions I want to look up what their active programs were and this is just the beginning of some ongoing research that I want to do but I really want to get this concept of space agencies under a certain type of grasp and understand like 
what the money is really being spent on, what are the expectations that you know, the population should have of space agencies. So for example, NASA's budget for fiscal year 2019 is $21.5 billion, and it represents 0.5% of the $4.4 trillion that the United, <laughs> the, United Space, the United States plans to spend this year. So since the beginning, NASA uh, has totally spent $600 billion. And when adjusted for inflation, it's about $1.3 trillion, averaging about $22 billion per year over its entire history. And we're talking about 1958 till today. So that's just a little snapshot of the numbers. The idea of the salaries is just that, so out of this $20 billion or so that NASA gets every year, they have about 17,000 employees. And so if you just take a quick, um, just try and get a quick snapshot of that, let's say everybody's making 50,000, that's roughly a billion dollars to maintain 17,000 or so employees. Possibly, give or take, like half a billion for health insurance, 401k, things like that. So you're left with about $19 billion in operating costs. And that's just the first start. The first um, concept that I wanted to get to was like, what does that really look like in terms of operations? You obviously have all these different um, real, real estate costs and overhead costs of maintaining facilities. These are some of the things that I'm looking up. Um, of course, we don't know exactly all those numbers, but that's something that I think is probably accessible in some way. And uh, let's see, so what was I trying to get to? What I was trying to get to are some of the active missions that are actually going on. Because it's easy enough to say like, oh, I've seen pictures from Cassini or, Hoy or uh, Juno and you know you think of the Apollo missions or Voyager but we really don't know all the missions that are actually transpiring right now <clears throat> what's happening Tammy and what's up how we done good to see you both okay so I've got a page with all the different missions that are active right now. I'm just going to read off a couple of them. So, obviously, alphabetically, there's a project called ASTER, A-S-T-E-R, called Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer. It was launched in 99, and it was designed to capture high-resolution images of Earth. We got, let's see, ASO, Airborne Snow Observatory. There's Avaris NG, Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, Next Generation. This is an acronym for... Doo -doo -doo. Okay, not a lot of information there. It looks like an airplane with infrared spectroscopy. Another one, Avaris, similar type of thing. Asteria is an arc second space telescope enabling research in astrophysics. So arc seconds and arc minutes are how resolution is measured in space. So that's why we can't see flags or things of really tiny detail on the moon using small telescopes because the, the resolving power is less than a certain number of arc seconds. Just have to adjust the scope. Bryce Eshelman says, where does it all go? I had a friend who worked there on the SS-120 something, or the STS. Right, that's the new rocket that they're working on, right? Or is that the SLS? Um, I'll get to it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, where does it all go? That's what I'm looking into. I'd like to have 
like some sort of answer instead of just guessing or really complaining or lamenting the situation without really knowing a bit more. What's up, Dagger Spells? Am I going to check out the Mercury Transit? Yep, I'm going to try. I really haven't done enough practice. I know it's coming up in a few days, six days, but we'll see. I've, I've been able to capture a lot of different events just by being ready to go and, and setting up. So I, there's a four hour window to capture the Mercury Transit and I will definitely be streaming if I can see it. All right, so we got the Space Telescope, we got AIRS, Atmospheric Infrared Sounder. The Atmospheric Infrared Sounder is a key tool for climate studies on greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide distribution, as well as weather forecasts. We got the ASC, the Autonomous Science Craft Experiment. This was launched in 2004, and it's an autonomous science craft experiment that can make autonomous decisions about what data to collect, process that, and send it back to Earth. I wonder what that's doing. What does that even mean? Like, it just decides what it wants to do without a signal, I guess. But these are a lot of, like, older programs. I think things that are launched in 2004 are being deprecated at this point or probably falling to Earth and burning up. So let's, let's keep going. Yo, what's up, Mary? Tornado. Happy chatters. Yeah, so just going through a few things, I was talking about the NASA budget and that it's about $22 billion and about, about two billion of that is used to staff. And let's say about a billion of it is used for real estate and facilities, probably more but it leaves about 16 or so billion to play with. And you wanna, you gotta figure all these missions that they're running, right? They have the different teams, and I guess, you know, they probably track a lot of these missions in the same uh, mission control, but I'm sure some of these require very specific types of scenarios where they have testing sites and they have duplicate versions of a lot of these uh, experiments on Earth like the Mars rovers, for example. So waiting here for the moon. It's really, really cloudy tonight, but see it peeking through the clouds. All right, let's keep going. There's CloudSat, there's Cold Atom Laboratory, a facility designed to fly aboard the International Space Station. Because I'm also looking at these in terms of like, I've captured a whole bunch of weird things, transiting the sky, transiting the moon, and thinking like, what are these things? Like, are they balloons? Are they asteroids, meteorites? Maybe there's some of these uh, satellites that are shaped oddly. CloudSat, ColdSat, okay, Cube, RRT, Radiometer Radio. What is this? This is pretty recent. So May 21st, 2018, the main objective of the Cube RRT mission is to demonstrate the RFI mitigation technology on a flight-ready, on flight-ready hardware. I don't know, some of this is very poorly written. <laughs> increasing, increasing technology readiness level from six to seven. Really strange stuff. Um. <laughs> All right, DSAC. This is Deep Space Atomic Clock. Launch date, June 22nd, 2019. So the Deep Space Atomic Clock is a technology demonstration of a small, ultra-precise mercury ion atomic clock, which we launched into Earth this is, I guess they wrote it before this went, launched into Earth orbit to test its potential as a next generation tool for spacecraft navigation, radio science, and global positioning systems. Okay. What's up, Scott Ferguson? Yep, just mentioned, but uh, I will try and stream like I always do. 
We'll see. There's like a four hour window to capture it, but it's in a particular spot, so I just gotta set up and, and go for it. Of course, I will try. I will do my best. All right, so that's the DSAC. Here's the DRS, the Disturbance Reduction System. This one's very cool. It says the Disturbance Reduction System, designed as part of the Space Technology 7 program, is an experimental system for measuring gravitational waves in space, which are thought to contain important data about the history of the universe. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got the DLRE, the Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment. This one was launched in 2009. The center of the moon. So the LRO, the Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment is designed to measure surface temperatures on the moon, providing key information for future lunar observations. Ah, okay. <sighs> Eco-stress and Grifex, and then... This one is interesting. Gravity recovery and climate experiment follow on. I'm going to link you guys to this because I think it's very important for people to gra have a sense of what NASA is actually working on. I'm going to quickly pull up Stellarium here and check the time of the Mercury transit. It's coming up on the 11th, obviously, and I think it's happening from like 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., if I remember correctly, but I'm going to double check. Look at that moon. How's it going? Yeah, so I remembered correctly, thankfully. It is roughly like 9 a.m. till 1 p.m. Eastern. And then, yeah, so from that period, you'll be able to look at the sun and see this tiny little speck going across it. Seems like there's some sunspots as well. So yeah, I'm gonna try and get up early and set up facing southeast and stream what I can. I'm sure I'll be able to get at least a shot in. So definitely put that on your calendars. 11, 11, 9 a.m. till 1 p.m. window. Bryce says, time is warped simply by sending a clock up into space and back down to Earth. We look through a telescope deep into space and say it is looking back in time. Related? So, 
What's up, Cleary? How's it going? So to me, I think I've gotten away from that idea that the romantic idea that somehow looking at things that are far away are looking into the past, because really everything that transpires within consciousness, I believe, happens within our frame of reference. So there's a gradient fall off from our central frame of reference to the information that we're getting, but the actual information is happening simultaneously. So I think that even if quasars are sending their light from a billion years ago, we're seeing them as they are today. We're not seeing them as they are two billion years ago. And I like, I think that, some, that people have been sort of duped by this language, this very poetic language of, of pop science that sells you ideas based on like, oh, it's so romantic. We're looking into the past, the way our ancestors, you know? as opposed to saying like, no, information travels instantly and we are part of observing things that are supposedly, you know, 26 trillion light years away. These things are instantly identifiable by us in terms of physical experience. So why do we lean on these very aggrandized ideas of, oh, it's so long ago, you know, when you look in the mirror, that's looking into the past. Look, I used to fall for it too. But when you really want to do science, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to speculate. What is really happening is that the moment that we experience right now is all that there is. All of the rest is really either memory or has not happened yet. So, oh Mary, sorry you're feeling not so good. Today it's going around, lots of people have been calling me saying they don't feel so hot. and. Just my, um, I can feel it in the atmosphere. So I hope you drink some, well, drink a lot of water and lay down and take it easy. What's happening, Oksana? Hey, hey. And what's up, Super Must See? What direction to what direction, Tammy? The sun will be rising somewhat in like the southeast and moving typically towards the west along the ecliptic. So it's like southeast to south. And then clocks uh, ticking differently from the surface of the Earth um, up into the, up to, let's say, the Karman line or to the Lagrange point. Um, these things are really the same sort of thing. Uh, there is no reconciliation for relativity as far as I'm concerned. It's all mathematical. The only frame of reference is the one reference right now. And now, and now, and now. Math wants to be able to control and to dissect reality, but reality itself is only one thing. And that thing shall not be named because it's just, um. Yeah. 
got no love for the homie Been no hate for the western forces When you speak out, you can sing loud Everybody wanna tear you down But come on, come on, come on Step to me, I got no love to give you We are the space race, we are the moon We are the franchise, we are the sequel Finger of the ether, how are we still here? Along the space race.
All right, y'all. It doesn't look like it's clearing, but we'll see. I had a feeling about it, but it's stuck. So there's a bit of footage from yesterday, and let's just keep talking about some of these missions. I pasted the link for y'all to see JPL NASA. I was just going through all these different missions that are active right now, and it's really interesting to see. It's just a lot of cubes and strange craft floating about up there. I feel like we talk about it a lot, or I think about it a lot, and I don't know exactly what's happening up there, so I'm just learning. The P-Rogue. You want to see a live stream of Earth spinning, doesn't everybody? <laughs> what can I tell you? Alright, so there's Griffix, there's Grace Bow, which is Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And there's Insight, which is the Insight lander on Mars. So this one launched on May 5th, 2018. I guess it's on its way to Mars, or maybe it already landed. Let me check this one. I'm going to click on a few and, and dive a bit deeper. Alright, so it's Insight. There's Isara, launched in 2017. The Isara mission will demonstrate a high bandwidth KA band CubeSat communications capability that is ready for immediate infusion into commercial government and military systems. There's IPEX, the International Payload Experiment. It's a 1U CubeSat developed by Cal Poly and, hmm, I don't know, maybe this next one. What about Jason 3? Extending the timeline of ocean surface topography um, begun by the Topex, Poseidon, and Jason 1 and 2 satellites. Jason 3 will make a highly detailed measurement of sea level on Earth to gain insight into ocean circulation and climate change. Lots of climate change stuff. All right, there's Juno. That's the famous Juno-Jupiter mission. There's the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer. So this one I mentioned before, the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer is a ground-based instrument connecting two eight meter, uh, meters three feet, so 36 inches by eight. That's about 288 inch scopes. Uh, so a combined capture of 576 inches, that's crazy. This is a large binocular telescope. There's the M cubed. Cove 2 is the Michigan multi-purpose mini satellite carrying the CubeSat board processing validation experiment. I know this, all this language that I'm talking about exists in a complete vacuum and might not make any sense to y'all. But I'm just going through it because no one's really ever listed out <laughs> all the missions that NASA's running today. And there are quite a lot of them. And I was talking about it kind of in reference to the NASA total budget that we're aware of as the public, which is about $22 billion, minus salaries of 17,000 employees. So let's say 20, uh, 2 to $3 billion to keep all these people employed. And let's say another couple of billion, I'm being very loosey-goosey with it, but let's say five, six billion for running NASA, and you got 20 billion a year, um, 22 coming in. So you have about 15 billion left over to play with, and then you have to run all these different missions that I'm, I'm listing out right here. Yo, what's going on, David Schmidt? Oh, this is a view from last night. Tonight is completely clouded right now. Just waiting for some views. So this is yesterday's waxing gibbous. 
You can see what the live view looks like if you jump back a bit. All right, so back to the list. This is the Mars Cube 1, May 5th, 2015, a twin communications relay CubeSat built by NASA's Jet Propulsion. JPL, Pasadena Constitute Technology, demonstration called Mars Cube 1. There's the Mars Odyssey mission, which launched back in 2001. With more than 10 years in orbit and counting, the 2001, so strange, I guess they haven't updated this page in a long time, or this content. <laughs> 10 years in orbit and counting, the 2001 Mars Odyssey spacecraft has spent more time in orbit around the red planet, collecting data on Mars' climate and geology more than any other spacecraft in history. And then right next to that, there's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO. Same sort of thing, but from 2005. more Mars missions, we got the MSL, Mars Service Laboratory Curiosity Rover. That's one of the most famous, obviously. Further, let's get back to local stuff. Miro, M-I-R-O, the microwave instrument for Rosetta Orbiter. So Rosetta Comet is studying gases given off by Comet 67P. And this is something that Electric Universe talks about all the time the off-gassing, out-gassing of the comets being interpreted as icy snowballs versus dusty rock objects moving through plasma and being and giving off, you know, filamentary action versus sublimation. Ask your local astrophysicist what they think of Comet 67P. A couple more. Let's see, Miro, MLS, MISR, Multi-Angle Imaging Spectroradiometer. This is from 99. So some of these, I, like I said earlier, I think the ones that have launched ages ago are sort of being deprecated, so some of them will crash to Earth and burn up in the atmosphere, some that we've just lost communications with. I'm going to go back through here at some point and check which ones are really actually happening. All right, there's a NEOWISE mission that uses a space telescope to hunt for asteroids and comets, including those that could pose a threat to Earth. And yet, I think they missed the one recently <laughs> that almost hit the moon. Um, all right, another one. Nuclear spectrosc Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or NUSTAR, will study the universe in high-energy X-rays to better understand the dynamics of black holes, exploding stars, and the most extreme active galaxies. Extreme. So much language in there that just doesn't need to be that pompous. Dang, y'all. I think it started to rain. <laughs> NASA's making it rain while I talk about them. Anyway, got to wrap it up real quick. I'll try and be back on later. Otherwise, I got a quick shot of the moon earlier, and I'll catch you all tomorrow, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by real quick, and hope you have a great rest of your night. I'll catch you all soon. <laughs> Peace.